In today's episode, we are going over what I did instead of a physical therapy residency. Let's do it. So what's the problem after PT school, right? Maybe you finish up with PT school and you want a little bit more. That could be you didn't reach that expert status that you wanted to be. Maybe you don't feel prepared or confident to start working with clients and patients out there. Maybe you want to have some additional mentoring. Maybe your clinical affiliations were just that typical mill setup where you're just driving through tons of patients and you don't have any guidance. You're just getting through it, right? And you actually want to make sure you're doing the right thing. Maybe you really, really want to accelerate your career. Maybe you're looking for a little more competency, some networking. You're looking for a very specific job placement. You don't feel like you got that with PT school and you need the next step. Well, the problem is that a residency often seems like it's the next step. However, it's not always reasonable. Okay. And I talked about this quite a bit in prior episodes. I'll leave a, a link in the show notes to check those out, but maybe it's the cost. So residencies could be somewhere between 10 and $40,000. Maybe it's a location. Maybe you can't find a good spot that you want to go to. Uh, could be that you have family obligations. Maybe you can't devote as much time to the residency that you need to. Or lastly, maybe it's just not a, a good fit for a variety of other reasons. Maybe it doesn't have the population that you want to work with, or the curriculum's not right for you. Could be a lot of reasons. So if you can't do a PT residency, but you want more, what is the solution, right? So today's show we're going over is seven steps to run your own residency. And this is exactly what I did after PT school. We're going over how to find your own niche. So that could be in running, strength, maybe this is powerlifting. We'll go over continuing education. That's courses, books, seminars, research studies. We'll go over mentoring, how to find good mentoring after PT school uh, from colleagues, local experts, and online experts. We'll go over getting more experience, and this is both with PT as well as in particular gyms or running clubs, whatever setting that you like. Uh, we'll go over how to network to get you where you want to be for your career. We'll go over shadowing, so shadowing for other PTs, but also for surgeons and coaches, so you can, can kind of increase your skills in your desired niche. And lastly, we'll go over teaching and sharing, which is a very powerful way to learn more and to become an expert. So welcome to the Fitness Pain-Free Show, where we help coaches and physical therapists like yourself get your patients out of pain and back to training in the gym where they belong. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist. I'm a coach. I'm a personal trainer and a meathead. I love all things weightlifting and fitness related. I have my dream job as a physical therapist, coach, business owner, and educator. I've been doing this for several decades now. My goal is to help you reach your goals and hopefully get to a similar place as me where you're happy every day working with the folks you like and just enjoying things in general, right? So this show is actually part of a three-part series, and this is part three. So if you haven't checked out part one and part two, I'll leave a link in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll leave a link right above my head. You can go ahead and click on that. But if you are watching this as your first entry point to the series, definitely go back and look at the other series or excuse me, other episodes in the series where we go over making the decision of whether or not you should even do a physical therapy residency. All right. So what did I do after school? Did I do a physical therapy residency? No, I didn't. And here's what happened. So I actually really wanted to do a PT residency. So I graduated from PT school in New Jersey at the University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey. Now it's known as Rutgers and uh, it's a great school. Really liked it. Good experience. And I wanted to do a residency program. Um, I really wanted to be an expert. I love learning. And I wanted to be better. And that was my main reason for wanting to do a residency. And my wife is a physician. And the training to become a physician, you go to medical school. And after medical school, you do what's called a residency. So when you're applying for residencies, you fly out to the different residencies around the United States. And then you rank the residencies on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of which ones you like the most. And then the schools do the same thing. So residencies rank you. And eventually there's a matching system, which I don't fully understand it, but basically this information goes to the computer and the computer kind of spits out your match. And uh, we were matched in Denver, Colorado, right? Which is pretty far from New Jersey. And when I looked around in Denver, Colorado, I pretty quickly found that there were no local residencies. Uh, there was a residency, I believe it was out in Vail. Um, but the year that I was going to be starting, it actually wasn't running. So there really were zero options and I'd have to kind of move into a different area and not stay with my wife at the time. And honestly, I didn't want to do that. That was the main reason why I didn't pursue a residency, right? I wanted to kind of start home and, and live with my wife. Right. So I really started to figure out how I can reach my own goals. Right. So since I couldn't do the PT residency and I wanted to meet my goals, 
first and foremost, I wanted to figure out what my goals were. Okay. And that's super important. So if you're just going and doing a residency, cause you feel like it's the next step, um, that's not a good way to go about it. You want to make sure you come up with some goals because if you don't know what your goals are, you're not sure if you're reaching them, right? So the, the physical therapy residency may or may not be meeting your needs. What are your needs? What are your goals? Right. For me, I wanted to specialize in strength and fitness. Okay. And that was actually CrossFit for the most part of the time. Uh, I've moved on to other forms of strength and fitness. I still love CrossFit. It's a big uh, baby of mine, but it always will be. But at the time, that was the most important thing to me. And I really wanted to be the top physical therapist in the fitness community, right? I wanted to be number one. And I wanted this to be locally, right? So I wanted the local gyms to know about me and respect me um, and be their go-to resource. But I also wanted this from a national and international level, right? I really wanted to be known as the guy, right? <clears throat> I also wanted to travel and speak internationally. A lot of the folks I looked up to at the time were doing this, and I just thought it was super cool, right? Um, keep in mind, you know, 20-something-year-old Dan is not the same as almost 40-year-old Dan right now. My goals at the time were really to just be as good as I could be. I also had an online business at the time, um, and I was sharing physical therapy and fitness content. And I was kind of helping the world, and my goal was to continue helping the world, but eventually try to profit in return, right? And that was a big part of what my career, what I wanted to have in my career. So I kind of had to seek out folks to help me with that. I was looking for the respect and admiration of my patients, but also the, the local greater CrossFit community, right? And that was also the global physical therapy, strength and fitness community. Uh, the folks I really looked up to at the time, guys like Mike Reinold, they had the respect of the entire, you know, physical therapy, physio world. And I thought that was amazing. I really wanted to, to try to become that, right? I wanted to have the respect and admiration of other influencers out there, excuse me, other influencers. And by that, I mean other strength conditioning folks, other CrossFit coaches, CrossFit athletes, uh, all the folks that are in my local community and my global community, right? And essentially, I just wanted to bring more value to the world, right? And I think this is a stage that most 20-somethings naturally go through, is that maybe they don't feel like they have a lot of value or self-worth. So they try to make themselves more valuable to the world. And I think this is a great thing, right? Obviously, it can be a bit unhealthy, um, but I think that as a human being, it makes sense to become valuable and show value to the world. And that's really what I wanted to build my own self-esteem and sense of self-worth. So step one, what did I do? Well, I found my niche. And at the time, that was CrossFit. Okay, I was very specific to CrossFit. And over the course of time, I, I started to specialize into Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting, running, more triathlon stuff now, uh, basically strength and fitness. But I started really in CrossFit. That was kind of my big market. So it was pretty easy to know where I had to go in order to improve my wisdom, right? And I really think that the more specific you go uh, in terms of choosing a patient population or niche, the more impactful you can be because you're going to be very, very good at working with a very specific population. You're going to be great at serving those folks, which is going to help things out a lot. If you're trying to specialize in a lot of different things, it just becomes a bit more challenging, right? So I think it's easier to choose a niche and eventually you can get a little bit bigger if you desire, um, but make it easier on yourself to start. Okay. So what are some action steps that you can do to help find your own niche? Figure out your ideal patient population niche and or community, right? What kind of person do I want do I want to work with on a regular basis, right? Are these young folks, older folks, running folks, CrossFit, strength, right? Maybe skiing, some other kind of niche population. Figure out the type of person that you want to serve, right? What type of person do you want your schedule filled with? And once you can answer that question, now we can go about learning and how to serve these folks better and getting on your patient panel so you can start treating them. Step two, we got to figure out continuing education. A huge part of a PT or residency is learning, okay? And I'll tell you what, you don't need a residency to learn. There's actually way too much stuff out there to learn, okay? This one is easy. Uh, the hard part is that you have to make sure that your learning is targeted, right? And also regimented. So I think the biggest piece of advice I can give to you is to devote time towards learning, and I think the best way, at least that I've learned how to do it, and then what I recommend to other folks, is to put this time into your schedule, okay? And for me, I'm a nutcase, okay? So take that with a grain of salt. You don't have to work as hard as I did. I'm just a maniac, okay? I devoted a lot of time and effort to this. So I put somewhere between one and three hours per day, every single day, and even on the weekends, right? A lot of weekends I didn't, right? But for the most part, even on weekends, I devoted time towards learning, 
right? Uh, and I put it in my schedule. So every morning before work, I would wake up, get on the computer, turn it on, and do some sort of learning. So make sure you set aside some time in your schedule to do some learning. Action steps. Create a learning schedule that works for you and your needs, okay? Maybe that's three days a week. Maybe it's every single day like me. Maybe it's just 30 minutes. Maybe you have a couple hours. Maybe you have a long commute, so you're doing a lot of your learning with audio books, right? That type of thing. Just make sure you have some sort of schedule for learning. Otherwise, it's probably not going to get done. Step two, make it specific to what you want to learn about, okay? You don't have to learn about TMJ and concussion and total shoulder replacements if you don't want to, okay? Some physical therapy residencies are going to be teaching you things that you don't necessarily find value in, right? Or are working with the patient population you eventually desire to work with, right? You don't have to do that. You can choose to learn exactly what you want to learn about to serve your patient population best, okay? So that's why I really like this idea of specificity. It's going to make you very good at working with the folks that you want to work with, okay? Uh, first and foremost, what I did was I bought courses, online courses, right? Uh, and I believe very strongly in doing this, okay? We'll talk about this a little bit later, but there are people out there that have probably already done what you want to do, okay? And they have spent years and years and years learning how to do that. They've made a lot of mistakes along the way, and they do this so that you can avoid those mistakes and accelerate your career faster than what they did, okay? So in my mind, it's ridiculous to think that you can figure this out all on your own, and it's stupid not to find the folks that are in the shoes you want to be and learn from them, okay? So if they have courses, right, either online or in, or in person, then you should pay for them and go learn from them so over the course of time, you can be where they are, okay? And for me, I initially did a lot of education in strength and conditioning, uh, this was an area I was already pretty familiar with because I worked in strength conditioning for a few years before I went to PT school. Uh, but it is a huge gap, right, in terms of knowledge for most PTs once they graduate. And for me, I love learning about it, and it definitely made me a better clinician. So what did I had to learn about? Um, a few of the texts that I read were Science and Practice of Strength Conditioning by Zet Siorski. I read a lot of Tudor Bampa's original work, which is all based around programming. Um, I just bought a whole bunch of books that were kind of highly regarded as the best in terms of what they're trying to teach us, so programming, strength and conditioning, uh, and just learned, right? I also did a lot of con ed from guys like Mike Boyle and Eric Cressy. So at the time, there weren't a lot of courses that were specific to CrossFit, right? Powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting. Now there are, right? So you don't have to go down this pathway. But I did a lot of learning from folks that were doing what I want to do, but in a different industry, right? So that's Mike Boyle. That's Eric Cressy. Obviously, Cressy is more in uh, baseball, and um, Boyle is more in sports performance. Uh, I wanted to work in sports, but it was more CrossFit, powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, right? So I learned a bunch from those folks, but now I would probably find courses, if you can, that are more specific to what you want to learn about, okay? I also took a bunch of courses early on uh, from James Fitzgerald. Um, his company is called OPEX. So there's a lot of individuals now that are responsible for running that. Uh, they had some great courses at the time for CrossFit coaches that wanted to apply strength and conditioning principles. So I really dove into that. Okay. So what are your action steps next for your own education? I want you to try to create a curriculum that works for you and your needs, right? So we know your population, right? What do you need to learn more about so you can be an expert? Okay. Maybe for you, you want to be involved in CrossFit, but you're already very good with programming. You don't need to go down that route. Maybe you need to learn more about exercise technique. You need to find some courses that are going to help you learn how to do the clean, right? The snatch or common gymnastics movements or running technique, whatever it is that helps to fill that niche for you. So guys, if you like what you're learning about so far, then I want you to go and check out the Fitness Pain-Free mini course. So I made a mini course. It's absolutely free. That's the next logical step if you want to learn more from me. So in the course, we go over five lessons. That first lesson is how traditional schooling has failed us, right? So schooling is phenomenal from a physical therapy perspective, but doesn't really teach you how to work with high-level athletes in the fitness world, right? Doesn't always teach you how to do the lifts appropriately. Doesn't teach you about progressions and regressions of common lifts within the gym, doesn't teach you how to program normally, how to write rehab programs, or how to write injury prevention programs for these folks. Next thing we go over, seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym, four simple steps to get your clients out of pain, how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community, 
it's all well and good if you know exactly how to work with folks within the gym. But if you can't get these folks through the door on a regular basis, then you're simply not going to be living the dream that you want to because you can't get the patients through the door that you want to work with. Okay, so I'll show you how to do that. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain-free certification, right? So I'll leave a link in the show notes. I definitely recommend checking this out. Once you sign up for the fitness pain-free mini course, you will be automatically placed in the wait list for the fitness pain-free certification. Now, the fitness pain-free certification is the course, the certification that I wish I had as a new grad that fills in all the gaps in knowledge that you don't get in physical therapy school. So A, you'll gain complete confidence working with injuries in the strength and fitness world. You'll learn optimal technique for both health and performance from myself and some of the best coaches in the world. You'll master programming for rehabilitation and injury prevention. Have fun while earning a whole bunch of physical therapy and physical therapy assistance credits. You have 31.5 of those. You'll also gain NSCA credits as well as CrossFit credits if you need those. This is the equivalent of a university education in working with injuries in the weight room. I really believe that. I've been adding to this thing over the past five or six years. It's massive, a ton of phenomenal information. And lastly, the biggest goal is just to fill your day with the patients you love working with and building the respect and admiration of the communities you love working with. So I'll leave a link in the show notes. Sign up for the Fitness Pain-Free mini course. The certification is open four times per year for one week to enroll into. If you're on the wait list by signing up for the fitness pain-free mini course, I'll alert you when that next enrollment period is open and you can get started. Let's get back to the show now. So what did I do from a physical therapy perspective for continuing education? So I took a lot of courses, right? Uh, the courses that I took were dry needling courses. I did some courses through IAOM. So they're joint specific courses, a lot of manual therapies. Um, I didn't get much manual therapy guidance in PT school and I wanted to learn more about it. So early on in my career, I spent a lot of time learning those principles. I took a few taping courses and I also had a lot of mentors, virtual mentors, right? I did get a chance to meet some of these folks in person. Um, but you know, keep in mind these folks are all over the world and it's not always reasonable. So I bought a lot of their courses. I followed them on YouTube. Uh, social media wasn't as big at the time. Blogs were big. So I read a lot of blogs over the course of time to learn more and more. I was luckily lucky that I had mentors out there that were doing what I wanted to do and they were teaching me how to do it. So guys like Mike Reinold, uh, Charlie Weingroff were all very influential in my own learning process. Okay. So what's your action step next to learn more from a physical therapy perspective? excuse me, physical therapy perspective, find some mentors out there that have created courses, right? Go and find their courses and then try to enroll into them. Okay. They can be in person. They can be online. I loved online because I had a lot of time in the morning that I scheduled aside. So I bought a whole bunch of online courses. I just systematically went through them over the course of time. Super helpful for me. I definitely recommend you guys do the same. Where else can you learn? I learned a ton from just going on PubMed and reading research. Okay. Uh, and to be honest, earlier on in my career, I spent more time doing courses and learning from others so I can quickly get into their shoes. Like I talked about before, but after a while, I actually drifted more over towards reading research and there's, you know, there's a lot of good ways to learn, but research is a phenomenal way to learn, right? I'm sure I'm, pe I'm preaching to the choir here. So how do you go about reading research in a way that kind of suits your own needs? Well, there's obviously a variety of ways to do it. Here's kind of what I did. So in a given niche, you're going to find certain pathologies that are more common, right? So if you're a running PT, Achilles tendinopathy and shin splints are probably going to be your bread and butter. So it really behooves you to go onto PubMed and see all the latest literature on these pathologies and get to get up to date on those and know how to treat them best, right? Makes sense. Uh, the other thing I did a lot of was I was looking up the pathologies for the patients I was currently seeing. And I think you get a lot of bang for your buck here just because you're actively learning about a pathology and then immediately applying it and talking to your patient about it. So not only are you gonna have a better outcome because now you know what's best for these folks, but those, these folks typically really um, like that you're doing that. You say, hey, Bobby, I looked at a research study about Achilles tendinopathy last night. I know it's what you're dealing with. I got a bunch of good ideas for you. The patient's probably gonna be like, oh, cool, that's great. This PT really cares about me, which is obviously a good situation to be in, right? The other thing I did a lot of is that I, I researched keywords, right, that are big in my own community, right? 
So I would research the keyword squat and deadlift and Olympic lifts in PubMed because you would see a bunch of cool research sites that are coming out. They're very specific to my niche. So you can spend some time doing that. You can also go to PubMed and you can have a notification set up. So when a new article comes out with the keyword squat, right, or deadlift in it, you get an email notification, which is actually quite helpful. Uh, because if you have some time allotted and you're supposed to be looking at research papers, you can go back and see like, okay, what are some good ones for me to read? This is one of the ways you can do it. I also had a few journals that I really liked that had uh, content that was relevant to my patient population. So I was looking through uh, Sports Health, uh, BJSM, uh, AJSM, as well as IJSPT were big journals for me. Uh, every month, I would just open them up. I would look through all the studies. I would read through the abstracts. And if there was a study that was very relevant, I think I was going to learn a lot from it. And I would actually read the entire study, right? And the last thing that I did a lot of, and I currently still do, um, is there are some pretty good research summary services out there. Uh, Mass is a good one. Um, monthly application of strength sports. Um, that's Greg Knuckles. And there's some other folks that run it. I apologize. I'm blanking on the names at the moment, but there are a bunch of services out there that will take the research and they'll try to break it down for you to make it easier to stay on top of these things. Uh, and they can be very, very helpful. Uh, one of the reasons I really like mass is because it's specific to strength sports, right? So I don't have to leave through sports med and 12 other research articles to find out the stuff that's relevant to me. They're already doing that work, right? So that ends up being really nice. So what are your next action steps here? I would use your scheduled learning time to read and research, okay? Using PubMed, using these services, trying to find the keywords, uh, researching your patient's pathologies or researching the pathologies are most common in your niche. This way, you're going to be very specific in your learning to help your patient population. Let's chat a bit about mentoring because this one is very, very important, okay? When I graduated, I definitely wanted strong mentors around me. Uh, most students that I work with currently really, really desire that. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to find a workplace that had a bunch of like minded professionals. So when I graduated PT school, we moved out to Colorado. I didn't know anyone. I had very little networking in that area. So what I started to do is just look around. I looked at all the local PT facilities, right? And I looked at the clinicians. I looked at what kind of credentials they had, right? I was looking for CS, CSs at the time. I was looking for OCSs. I was looking at SCSs. I really liked the selected functional movement assessment at the time. So I was looking out for professionals that had that. I also wanted to learn more about things like dry needling. So I was looking for clinicians that had that, okay? And what I did was I just started visiting these clinics, bringing them coffee, bringing them donuts, figuring out how I can help them, right? and asking if I can shadow, right? And most places, if you're bringing donuts, they're pretty cool with you just hanging out, all right? And over the course of time, figure out if you can be more helpful. So one of the clinics I really enjoyed being at, right, that had a lot of clinicians I thought were very good, they were volunteering once a year at a local high school and they're doing FMSs. Uh, so A, I thought that was cool. I really like that functional movement screens for folks who don't know the FMSs. And I wanted to help out and I did. And you know what ended up happening was this clinic was going to hire one of their students. One of those students ended up bailing and they offered me the job. Okay. So you can do the same thing. You can find local clinics, right? You can get a flavor of how they practice. So for me, I was able to go inside of a lot of these clinics and see how they actually end up doing their physical therapy. See if I jive with that. If I do awesome, I can see if there's a job opportunity, right? And I got to tell you, I looked at a lot of different clinics and there were no job opportunities. Um, so sometimes that can be challenging, but definitely don't give up because I was told by several headhunters that I would never find a job orthopedics in the Denver area. And lo and behold, a couple months later, I did. And it was in a clinic that I actually wanted to work in, right? So find a great workplace that has good mentors. I did. And what I ended up doing was obviously bouncing ideas off of these clinicians every day when I was working with folks asking for advice, but I also scheduled time outside of my normal hours to shadow these folks, right? So think about your schedule that you created for continuing education. You can do the same thing for shadowing and mentoring. So I would either come in early, right? Or I would stay late. Or if I had a patient that canceled, I would go over and talk and speak to the other clinicians as they were working with their clients. And I just learned and soaked it all up, right? Great environment to be in. Now, the next thing is that in my direct clinic, 
there was, there were no clinicians that were treating, let's say CrossFit or powerlifting or strength sports. Right. Um, so I wanted to find some local clinicians that were doing that. And I did. So from working in multiple CrossFit gyms, we'll get to that in a minute, right? Um, through my networking with CrossFit coaches, I actually found a good, good PT, a couple good PTs, but one good PT named Justin Dudley, a phenomenal, um, CrossFit PT, PT in general, cascade physical therapy, uh, up in the Denver area. If you're ever looking for a good PT up there. Um, but he was working with a lot of CrossFit athletes and I basically just had one of my PT friends, uh, connect me with him. And then I asked, Hey, can I come shadow you? Can I come learn from you? And he was awesome. He said, yeah, no problem. Come on in. Um, and I set aside time in my schedule. I think, I, you know, my, I talked to my boss who was great about doing this, but I kind of shadowed in the less busy times of the day. So somewhere between let's say 10 and two, usually, uh, in PT, uh, facilities, if you're not working in geriatrics, that's an area of the day that there's not a lot of folks can actually get in for PT. Uh, so what I did is that I didn't work during those hours. I worked more kind of the early hours or later hours, which was actually kind of helpful, um, for my job at the time. And they allowed me to do this, uh, just because they're trying to have more PTs available in those busier hours. And I fulfilled that. And I went and I did some mentoring with Justin Dudley and we worked together with a couple of CrossFit athletes. He gave me a couple of good ideas. I bounced some ideas off of him and I learned more. And I feel like I got a really good mentoring experience in the niche that I wanted to try to grow into. Okay. The other thing I did a lot of, continue to do a lot of, and I definitely recommend you do, is to seek out some virtual mentors, right? Uh, guys like Mike Reinold, you know, and it's funny because I looked up to this, this gentleman uh, before I started working there, right? And eventually I was kind of networked a bunch and was given the opportunity to work there. And I've worked next to Mike for the past six years now. Um, so it's been a pretty cool experience, but I looked up to him years ago. I really liked what he was doing. And I wanted to try to become what he is currently. Uh, and I'm on my way, right? We're doing good at this point. And uh, I just read all of his stuff. I watched all of his YouTube videos. I bought all of his continued education courses, right? Uh, I emailed him. I reached out to him. We actually collaborated a little bit in terms of sharing each other's content. Um, so I, that was a very good learning experience for me. Uh, like I said earlier, trying to find folks that are in the shoes that you want to be in, right? And it's, it's going to be much faster for you to learn from them and figure out how they did it as opposed to figuring out yourself. So uh, that's a big thing that I did from a mentoring perspective. I was learning a ton from him despite he was not in my face, actively teaching me. Right. <clears throat> and I would say some of the best mentors I've had over the course of my life have all been virtual. Um, a lot of which have no idea who I am. Right. So you don't have to meet the person to learn from that person. You can get a lot of very good online virtual mentoring, uh, via the free content that these folks are putting out the books they put out, the, the courses they put out, right. Whatever it is, right. So seek those guys out and learn from them. So what are the action steps for you next? Find mentors who've accomplished what you desire in your career and set aside some time to learn from them, okay? There's a reason why they are where they are today, and you can accelerate your career much faster by learning how to follow those steps, right? Avoid those pitfalls. Next thing you got to do is get some experience, right? So PT residencies are great at giving you a ton of experience, okay? They're going to throw you in the fire, and you're going to learn quite a bit. Um, one of the things that I think students undervalue is that if you start a full-time job and you have a full patient panel, and if you're working in a facility that is kind of classified as a mill and you see lots and lots and lots of patients, that can be a tremendous, tremendous learning experience, okay? It's not a bad thing. That can be a very, very good thing. Now, do you have to do this for the rest of your life? Of course not. You don't have to do this for the rest of your life if you don't want to, but you get a ton of reps in if you see a lot of patients. So I actually feel as though if you just start a job at a PT school with 40 hours a week worth of one-on-one -on -one patient care or kind of like semi-private environment, whatever it is, uh, you will get more reps in than if you go to a PT residency program. Okay. So keep that in mind. That can be a very good thing. And I think the thing that helped me the most, right, is to really do your job with intent. Okay. And what do I mean by this? Uh, I think you guys all know those clinicians that kind of come in and they, they punch the clock and they have all their patients and they punch the clock at the end of the day and they leave and do the same thing every single day. And they don't seem to put much into their job. I'm not trying to knock people for this. All right. Because it's, it's very hard to do an extremely 
extremely good job every single day. That's, um, that's very exhausting and it can lead to burnout, right? So I'm not trying to hate on these folks. All right. Apologize if this is kind of hurtful to anyone. Um, but you can also do your job with great intense and trying to reach clinical excellence. Okay. So you can do a great job of communicating with your patients, trying to build great rapport. Okay. Trying to build kind of that mutual respect, showing empathy, right? You can do a good job of doing that. Um, you can be very good about your diagnosis, picking the best special tests, knowing the best sensitivities and specificities, giving your patients the best answers that they're looking for. You can really develop rock solid plans of care, right? You can always work on your manual techniques, your coaching skills, how you work someone through given movements, right? Uh, your efficiency uh, from a patient visit perspective, what you start with, what you end with, making sure you do a good job, getting all of your work done in a given day. One of the most valuable things I did a lot of early on in my career is reflecting. So on my drive home every single day, I would just run through my day with all my patients say, how did that go today? Right. Could I have done a little bit better? Right. Did this patient get fully served by me? How can I improve in the future? Right. And that's very powerful because you're going to grow every single day just by trying to figure out what you're good at, what you're not good at, where you need to improve. Right. So very, very valuable thing. And I think that I've never really heard this advice given uh, from other clinicians, uh, but I think it's really important and really helped me a ton. Okay. And the other thing I did uh, for the first year of my career is every day when I went home after a long day of seeing patients, even though I was tired, I looked at my patient panel the next day and I created a plan, right? So I wrote out exercises. I wrote out the manual techniques I'm going to try. I wrote out what I'm going to say to those folks, right? Maybe I rehearsed the education I was going to give them. I did a lot of talking in my own car, probably sounded like a lunatic. Thank God no one was in the car with me, right? But it was a great opportunity to try to learn and try to create a better plan for my patients. And over the course of time, I stopped doing that quite as much. I actually think they would make me a better clinician if I still did this to this day, right? Uh, but in the beginning stages, this was very useful. because It's hard to figure out exactly what to do on the spot. So if you think about it in advance, when you're kind of relaxed, calm, you can come up with a really good plan of care and it just serves that patient a little bit better, right? So to kind of summarize this, perfect practice makes perfect, okay? So experience is important, but you just want to make sure that you're constantly improving and you're practicing excellence. You're practicing being better each time, right? 1% better every time, every day, uh, over the course of time, you're going to be phenomenal, right? So what are your action steps for this lesson here? Do your job with the active intent of improving with each patient, right? It's not going to be perfect. We know that. You're going to make mistakes. We know that. That's fine, right? But learn from those mistakes, all right? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, okay? So basically, if you're making mistakes and you're not learning from them, that's no bueno, okay? Keep improving over the course of time. Next type of experience you're going to need is going to be activity within your given community, all right? So not just physical therapy experience. So for me, this is pretty easy. I needed to get started in the CrossFit community, and it was not too tough because I already loved doing it and have been doing it for years and was planning on continuing. Uh, most of the students that I speak to that want to get involved in something like CrossFit are already doing it. So that is a pretty easy bridge to gap, right? Um, when I moved from uh, New Jersey over to Denver, I had absolutely zero contacts. So one of the first things I was trying to do is find a great gym around me. Uh, one gym that I could do a variety of things. So one, I was still competitive. I wanted to train and work really hard, uh, get experience that way, uh, grow as an athlete. I wanted to try to be a part of a really good community, right? Uh, the other part is I wanted to coach. And eventually I wanted to try to get some of the athletes within the gym to come to me with their pain problems so I could work with them because that's pretty much the reason why I went to PT school in the first place is to help folks in the fitness community. I went to between 10 and 12 different CrossFit gyms to see if they had any openings for coaches, right? And they didn't, unfortunately, right? Um, here's me, several years worth of experience as a CrossFit coach, um, probably about four to five years of actually doing some sort of personal trainer coaching full time, uh, now have a doctorate in physical therapy and none of the gyms wanted to have me. Okay. Uh, so that was a little bit of a hit on my ego, but that didn't really stop me 
Um, the gym I liked most was called CrossFit Verve, just because it had really good owners. Um, Matt and Shree Chan at the time, Eric Clancy and Courtney Shepard have taken over. I think since then they've kind of moved back in, but I wanted to learn from these folks, had an excellent community. So that was a gym that I ended up joining. After a while, I, I said, Hey, do you have any job openings? And they said, you know, you have to intern first. And again, another knock on my ego, but I spent, I want to say three to four months interning before I was actually offered a job. And from there, I learned so much, right? Because now on a regular basis, not only was I training the movements and growing and getting better, I was coaching other folks, right? And I was coming up with plans for the day and I was managing people and I was coaching the movements. And that really elevated my game as a coach, obviously, but as a physical therapist too, because I was going to be working with a lot of these folks in the CrossFit world. So I fully understood what they were trying to get back to. Plus, I was seeing them on both sides of the fence, right? Uh, oftentimes, the PT, you only see folks when they're hurt. You don't get a chance to see them when they're not hurt. Uh, so I was able to do that. And I think that's a really good experience that you should have, right? So if you really want to be a part of your community, I recommend that you join your community. So that could be a running club. That could be a powerlifting gym. That could be an Olympic weightlifting gym. That could be a CrossFit gym. Whatever it is, be a part of that community and see if you can help out by coaching. The other thing that really helps out is trying to stay in the know. What I mean by that is, is what websites are your population, your target market um, going to? What kind of books are they reading? What kind of social media accounts are they following? Are there competitions that are really big, right? Are there athletes that are very, very popular, right? So if you're staying abreast of what's going on within that world, that automatically gives you a little bit more authority because you kind of you're part of that community, right? And people understand that because you can talk the talk and you walk the walk as well. The next piece that can be really powerful is just volunteering. And this really could be as easy as someone within your gym is moving and you're just helping them move their stuff or you're going to like birthday parties, right? Whatever it is, being part of that community is important. Uh, but I think it's more powerful is volunteering in the sense that if there's a competition, you're going to help out there. You could be part of the medical tent, right? I did a lot of um, free talks when I got started as a physical therapist, so I'd basically go into a gym and I would talk to folks about mobility or injury prevention or what to do if you have shoulder pain or knee pain, whatever else it is, right? Uh, I really built myself into that community by showing that I was an expert and that's really going to make you a better clinician, but it's also going to be helpful to eventually get more patients through the door, right? Which is again, great because you're going to use that as experience to be a better clinician in the population that you're chosen. So the action steps here get actively involved in the community that you want to serve. Step number five, networking. So the first group of folks that I did a lot of networking with, it was very powerful for me in my education was coaches, gyms, and trainers. Okay. So first and foremost, I'm trying to be involved in the community. And one of the best ways to be involved in the community is to know the gyms, know the owners and be friendly with them. Okay. So That'll help out exponentially because these gyms have hurt athletes. They want to get their athletes better and they rely on physical therapists like you and me to work with them and not tell them they're stupid and they need to stop doing CrossFit. Uh, one of the things that coaches and trainers are very fearful of is basically sending their client to a physical therapist or doctor and the doctor is saying, hey, of course you've got hurt. How stupid can you be to be doing CrossFit, right? So if you can be that trusted physical therapist within your network, then you're going to get a lot of referrals and you're going to make a lot of trust in your community. Okay. It's very important. So as I started to develop relationships with these coaches, you would know they'd get small injuries here and there. And you can just offer and say, Hey, you know, I'm a physical therapist. If you want some help, stop by after work. Let me treat you a little bit, right? We'll do it for free. And then uh, hopefully get you back to training. Right. And there's a lot of reciprocity that comes from that. So if you start working with a CrossFit coach for free, they're going to be extremely thankful and they'll probably send you another five to 10 individuals your way, right? Now, this is phenomenal from an experience perspective because you're trying to get more uh, CrossFit folks or fitness folks, whatever it is, on your belt so you can get some more experience, right? And the better you treat the individuals that are coming from a CrossFit gym, the more those individuals are likely to tell their friends and all of a sudden you're that go-to individual within that gym. I also think it's really valuable to try to network with like-minded physical therapists. I think sometimes physical therapists aren't really friendly with one another um, within a local community just because they're seen as competition, right? And there is, right? There is some of that competition, uh, but largely there's enough injuries to go around, you know? And I'm a big believer in the, uh, the saying that a rising tide brings up all ships. 
So if you're involved in this tight knit group of physical therapists that work in CrossFit, right? And one of the physical therapists works a little bit with an athlete that has an injury, but that athlete lives pretty far away and they're actually a lot closer to where you live. They may refer them to you and all of a sudden that athlete has a better experience, right? And then the athlete is happy and they like the physical therapist they're initially working with. And now they like the new one and they're even more thankful, right? Over the course of time, maybe I return the favor. I refer patients that way if they're a little bit closer and it's just a really good relationship, right? So next action step for creating your own physical therapy residency, reach out to local professionals and see how you can help. Next step to building your own PT residency, shadowing. The first group of individuals I spent a lot of time shadowing was different coaches and trainers, okay? So when you go to PT school, they actually do a very good job of exposing you to a wide variety of problems, knowing red flags, knowing when someone's dealing with something more serious, so you have to refer out to someone else, right? Dealing with common orthopedic issues, but largely we're lacking the knowledge from a strength conditioning standpoint, an exercise standpoint, right? We don't have that coaching or training experience. So for me, I spent a lot of time learning from other smarter coaches than me, right? And the place where I got most of my education was through Power Monkey Fitness. And I was very, very lucky to start working for these individuals. Uh, long story short, CrossFit HQ contacted me and asked if I wanted to be on a, a roundtable discussion about the safety of kipping pull-ups. I said, yes, they flew me out there. I had no idea what was going to happen. I was actually supposed to debate against Dave Durante, six-time Team USA uh, Olympic alternate for gymnastics. I was like, great, I'm out here and I have to argue against this super smart individual who has a ton of experience. Awesome. <clears throat> Long story short, we actually didn't disagree. We fully agreed in a lot of ways about how we should treat individuals safely in the gym, became buddies. I invited him on my podcast. Eventually, he offered me a job within Power Monkey Fitness. And since then, I had the opportunity to work with some of the best coaches in the world, in the world of Olympic weightlifting, gymnastics, running, kettlebells, rowing, all sorts of awesome stuff. Um, but yeah, I had to really work on honing my craft by working with individuals that weren't necessarily in my profession. And that's going to require a lot of humility because as a, a doctorate of physical therapy, sometimes we think we know it all, right? Uh, but really, we don't. We can learn a lot. So if you let your ego go aside and follow some really smart individuals in the fitness world, that's going to elevate your game for sure, right? I also spent a lot of time shadowing PTs. We already talked about that. I shadowed the folks within my own workplace, as well as some local folks that were very good in the CrossFit community. And I also spent a lot of time shadowing surgeons, right? So I think one of the uh, appealing aspects of PT residencies is the ability to work with surgeons, right? And I actually agree with that. I think that's really good because you're going to learn a ton working with these folks. Uh, as physical therapists, we see post-surgical folks all the time, right? And the surgeons have a lot of information they can share with us. And the more that we know about what they do, the better we can be treating our patients, right? The thing is, it's actually not that tough to learn from surgeons. And I spend a ton of time shadowing surgeons, right? So the more obvious one that we see all the time is going and watching surgeries. And I did a lot of that, right? So basically I found some really good surgeons in the area that were catering to my CrossFit athletes that I was seeing, right? And I would just reach out to them and I'd say, can I watch a surgery? And they'd say, sure, that sounds great. And they'd allow me to come in and I'd watch the surgery. But what I think was even more powerful for me in terms of establishing a network and being able to open up a great line of communication between some of the surgeons was me going to my patient appointments, right? So essentially, I'd have a patient that was considering going to the surgeon. I would recommend a surgeon and I'd say, hey, are you okay if I actually go to the appointment with you, right? The patient's like, oh yeah, no problem. And once I got there, I got a chance to hear what the surgeon was going to say. And the surgeon realizes that I really care about the patient patient realized I really care about them. And it's a great opportunity for me to learn. And I develop a really good network with the surgeon. And if you do this enough times, what ends up happening is a surgeon trusts you. They're more likely to refer more patients to you, especially the type of patients that you like to see, right? So I spend a lot of time not only watching surgeries, because it's pretty easy. If you just talk to the surgeons, they usually say yes, right? But a lot of times an outpatient facility, because you can actually talk to that surgeon and build some more trust, right? So if you're looking for that experience working with surgeons, you can definitely do it on your own. You just have to find good surgeons and then reach out. 
action steps for shadowing. Spend time shadowing local experts to gain additional knowledge and experience. And the last piece of this little puzzle here is going to be teaching and sharing. Now, for me, this was absolutely one of my favorite things to do within the world of fitness and physical therapy. Obviously, I run fitnesspainfree.com. Um, I've actually been running it for over 10 years, right? Uh, I don't know if you find me recently or whatever it is, but this goes back years and years and years for me, right? Um, there's a lot of power that comes from teaching others and sharing with others. And one of the first ways I started doing this was with Fitness Pain Free, but then by teaching students, right? So I became a clinical instructor right away uh, in my first job. I probably worked with around 10 to 12 students in the first three years of my career, right? And then later at Champion, there's like three to five students going at all times in our facility. So I've worked with a lot of students over the past 10 years or so. And I'll tell you what, students really challenge you and make you grow, okay? You really have to know your stuff because you don't know your stuff and students are asking you tough questions, you look and feel like an idiot, right? So you want to be able to answer the questions that the students are asking you, right? And the other piece is that if you understand something well enough that you can teach it, you fully understand something, right? So on a regular basis, if you have a student that's looking over your shoulder and you're explaining what you're doing, not only is that keeping you honest make sure you're making good choices from a clinical reasoning perspective, but it makes you fully have to understand the subject so you can teach it to someone else, right? And that is great for mastery. Uh, the other thing that I did a bunch of was social media, right? And believe it or not, I started off with a website and a blog. Um, blogs are kind of a thing of the past. If that is kind of transitioned to social media, so I still do one blog post a week. I've actually done one blog post a week for the past 10 years or so on fitnesspainfree.com. But in the past several years, I've really shifted over to social media. Uh, what's really cool about social media is that if you learn something new, you can immediately share it. And if you share that, and if you're on my social media, I share a, a bazillion quotes, right? I'm, I'm releasing like three pieces of content every single day. You are expanding the knowledge of everyone else in this world, right? You are potentially being challenged, which I think is actually pretty helpful because your thoughts might not be completely right. And people try to poke holes in it and it causes you to rethink what you're putting out there, right? Um, and you're adding value by putting out these quotes, sharing it, causing discussion. I think that helps from a learning perspective. So um, I actually enjoy social media if it's, if it's done properly. Obviously, we spend too much time on there. It can lead to some issues. But if you're a creator and creating more content that's helping the world, I think that's super beneficial, right? And the other piece you can do is just travel and speak, all right? Uh, at first, I did a lot of this for free. But then when I started working for companies like Power Monkey Fitness, and I got hired by other friends, and I was traveling nationally and internationally, I just had the opportunity to try to teach others. And again, when you have to teach other people, it helps with concept mastery. It's also a very different skill than what you learn in physical therapy school. Uh, so it's been a fun, challenging thing for me. And like I said, I wanted to speak nationally and internationally. So me getting some reps in, doing this more and more was in line with my goals. And I really enjoyed it, right? So action steps here, seek out opportunities to teach others and share what you're learning. So guys, that is it for the lesson today, but that is not it for your learning. So when you graduate as a physical therapist, sometimes you're not in your dream job. And I get it. It takes a lot of effort to work in the population you want and really look forward to the patients that you see every single day. So I made a lesson for you. It's another fitness pain-free show. It's called Five Steps to Earning the Respect of Your Community and Building the Career of Your Dreams. And we'll just dive deep on this subject so you can start working with the population that you love. This way, every single Sunday, you won't have the Sunday scaries because you don't want to go into work Monday morning because you got a whole bunch of patients on your panel that you don't feel like working with. Let me show you how to track the population that you love working with. So every single day you love your life, right? And you love your work. So go ahead and click on this link above and get started on that lesson. That is it for today's episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you on the next one. Lastly, thank you, thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button. Comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Am I missing anything? Have you done a residency? Do you feel differently than me? I would love to hear your comments on this. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you're listening to the podcast version of this video, 
please leave me a positive rating and review. It helps me out tremendously. If you want to go that extra step and support me further, please consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. Think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. It's premium content from me. I update this every month. I've been doing it for the past five years. It's an absolute ridiculous amount of information. You've got over 100 webinars, eBooks, and complete guides. You have access to a private Facebook group to have all your questions answered by me. You can decide some upcoming podcast topics. I'd love to answer questions that you have. So you get started for $1 for a week trial. After that, it's $12.99 per month, right? Dirt cheap. It is a no brainer if you want to try to learn more from me. So I'm going to leave a link in the show notes. You can check that out. You can also head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library to get started. All right. You won't be disappointed. And lastly, here are the references. So, what I did was I put a link to the University of Delaware residency program as well as MGH's sports residency program. I think they're both phenomenal residency programs. So, if you want to learn a little bit more, I recommend clicking on those and just get acquainted uh, and see what they have to offer. Right. So if you want to play around with an interest calculator, see how much money you could have made uh, as opposed to going to physical therapy residency, then go ahead and click on that. Otherwise, thanks a lot, guys, and I'll see you on the next one.